Mr. Mosier, president of the Population Research Institute, has authored several books on China. I owe a debt of gratitude to the person whom I understand was one of the founders of the doctor, uh, Doctors for Disaster Preparedness, uh, the first editor of Access to Energy. And I owe Peter Beckman a debt of gratitude because uh, in those dark days when my dissertation committee at Stanford had spontaneously disbanded, uh, he called me up to offer solace. Imploded, as it were, one by one. The first one came to me and said, now this was after I had gone to China and found myself caught up in the most horrendous population control program the world has ever seen. By no means the only population control program. There are many underway right now as we speak. But this was particularly barbaric because it involved the forced abortion and forced sterilization of women at all stages in pregnancy, including in the third trimester of pregnancy. I was an eyewitness to these crimes in China. I was a rather stunned eyewitness, I have to admit. I had gone to China uh, thinking that, uh, that abortion was uh, a, a woman's choice. I had gone to China thinking that China needed, above all else, population control in order to develop economically. I apologize for having ever believed those things, but I must say that I had been taught them in part at Stanford University. And when I came back to tell um, my friends on the Stanford professorate that uh, women in the third trimester of pregnancy were being forcibly aborted and wasn't this a violation of choice, uh, one of them said to me, well, it may be, but you know, upon further reflection, uh, the forced abortion of a woman in the third trimester of pregnancy is no worse than uh, the Reagan administration denying federal funding to women who want abortions, which to me was a rather strained analogy. And then he resigned from my dissertation committee. Uh, the second one came to me, and uh, this fellow at least had the, the, uh, the decency to be honest about his motivation. He said, you know, Steve, I, I have a research proposal to go in, uh, in before the scholarly committee on communications with the People's Republic of China, and uh, it's right now in Beijing being considered by the Chinese side, and uh, so I, I want to go to China and do research, and, and they're telling me that uh, if I have anything to do with you, I can't go, so I'm, I'm going to have to resign from your committee. Uh, and so it went. So then, and at the end of the day, when I finished writing my dissertation, and those of you who have written dissertations know that that can be an arduous and lonely task, there was no one to read it. <laughs> no one to read it. And I went to the Stanford administration, then head, headed by uh, Donald Kennedy, whom some of you probably know from other contexts, uh, and said, I have uh, some uh, professors in other departments who are willing to form a special committee to read my dissertation. Will you allow that? Uh, his answer was a 68-page document listing all of my crimes against the people, which he publicly disseminated before showing to me. So uh, the answer was no. <laughs> But it was interesting that at the end of a six-year review process the, that, and, and a 68-page letter to me, uh, the letter concluded by saying this, and, and this was the final word, really the final, the final episode, the, the epilogue to my academic career. Uh, the letter said, uh, we don't know that if all of these allegations that have been made against you are true or not, after repeating them in great detail for 67 pages. And we don't know whether these allegations are true or not, but, but there has been a gradual erosion of trust between you and the anthropology department, which makes it impossible for you to continue in the program. Well, of course there'd been an erosion of trust. You know, after being investigated for four years, I didn't trust them <laughs> at all. <laughs> but the reason that Stanford refused to give me the PhD was because they didn't trust me. And I'm afraid that what I'm about to say tonight will only give them more reason not to trust me. But Peter Beckman called during those days and, and he said, you know, I, I'd like to help. I, I think you've been railroaded. I think you've been treated very badly. He said, I'm going to write about uh, what's happening.
to you in access to energy. And that article came out and uh, I was surprised at how many people responded to that article by contacting me and offering various kinds of help and support. Uh, life went on. Um, I did not go back. I wrote a couple of books on China. I did not go back uh, to a, a university anywhere to get the PhD because Stanford, in the, at the end of the day, I think Stanford, I realized Stanford had given me something more important than a PhD. They had given me an education <laughs> in how the real world works. And so the $45,000 in tuition, or whatever it was, wasn't entirely wasted. Uh, and of course, Stanford's education very neatly dovetailed with the education that I got at, at, at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, they were just <laughs> two peas in a pod. But um, China uh, had become my fascination in the early 1970s. And so I spent... Uh, several years in Asia learning Chinese, I went back to Stanford really to, to sit at the feet of a couple of Sinologists, learn more about China, got to go to China when the door uh, to that country had just opened up to foreign researchers in 1979 and uh, found a number of things about, uh, found that most of what I had been taught about China wasn't true. Um, uh, the new Maoist man nonsense, the uh, the economic progress, nonsense. The improvement of health care by using barefoot doctors, nonsense. Um, I actually wound up my research by, by surveying a couple hundred people in the village who were old enough to remember how things had been before the Chinese Communist Party took over in 1949. And I had them rank order the times of their lives. I asked them when they had eaten well, when they had dressed well, when they had celebrated the great Chinese feast days with a special fervor. Judging from that, of course, when, when per capita incomes had been high and when they'd been low, and it turned out that those who were old enough to remember said that times had never been better in the late 1920s and early 1930s, and that things had been downhill since then. Well, the Chinese Communist Party didn't like that at all. <laughs> it turned out to be true, of course. Things have been improving in China with the market reforms of the last 20 years, but the, the, the first three decades of communist rule in China were dismal, dismal indeed. The one-child policy began when I was in China. And uh, you might think that the one-child policy is a typical expression <clears throat> of totalitarian exuberance, right? We have a, a one-party dictatorship, the vanguard of the proletariat, deciding for the Chinese people how many children they're going to have, namely one. And then going beyond that to lay down very detailed bureaucratic procedures enforced by tens of millions of little bureaucrats uh, throughout the country who are given enormous powers to arrest and detain and sterilize and abort people. Well, that's certainly part of the story. But the story of China's one-child policy really begins with the Club of Rome report by Meadows et al. in 1974. You remember the Club of Rome report uh, purported to use control theory uh, systems engineering uh, and a number of uh, unfounded assumptions to predict that the world was going to uh, cease to exist at least as a, a habitable planet uh, by the year 2080. Well it turned out that uh, that was all a hoax. Uh, the, the chief author of the report two years later in 1976 admitted that they had exaggerated for effect, asked why, they said well we needed to get the attention of Western governments so that people would begin paying attention to the problem of population growth and resource depletion. So they exaggerated for effect. They pulled a little hoax, in other words, a uh, scientific hoax, on the world community. And of course they had the best intentions in the world, didn't they? But among those who read The Limits to Growth were a couple of visiting systems engineers from China, uh, one by the name of Mr. Dr. Song Jian. And Song Jian had been locked up inside uh, the People's Republic of China for, for the Cultural Revolution decade. I mean locked up in the sense he was never in the Chinese gulag, but he, like all other Chinese intellectuals, had been uh, under house arrest. Uh, they had been 
uh, tortured by the Red Guards, treated very badly, certainly not allowed to travel out of the country, not allowed access to, to Western reading material, not allowed to keep up with the, the latest uh, advances in the West. And, and this was really in 1978 when he went to Europe. This was his first trip outside of China in a decade and a half. And he was eager to get his hands on the latest Western science so he could catch up with everything that, that, that he'd fallen behind in the last 15 years. And what did he lay his hands on? But the limits to growth. Only the limits to growth. He didn't read the later retraction. He didn't read the critiques that came out at the same time. He just got a copy of the limits to growth and thought, this is what control theory can do for China. It can help us in China understand what kind of population limitations we need to impose on the people. And so what he did was a takeoff on the limits to growth. He went to the Chinese leadership with the first computer projection of population growth, assuming uh, various fertility levels, that had ever been done in China. And the Chinese leadership from Deng Xiaoping on down was very impressed with the latest in, in, in Western science. And they were impressed because science and technology was what they wanted. That was the first of the four modernizations that they talked about. They wanted to make China into a strong and powerful uh, nation. A nation with a strong and advanced technology. A nation with a strong and dominant military. And they thought this was the path to uh, restoring China's lost glory. And so they swallowed this nonsense. And what did, what did Song Jian say precisely? He said, well, given current levels of population growth in China, uh, China will face economic collapse within 100 years, in the year 2080. And so we must lower the birth rate down to one child per couple in order to avoid this calamity. And that's exactly what the leadership did. So when we talk about 10 million women uh, being forcibly aborted in China every year, roughly equal numbers of women being sterilized, uh, having IUDs inserted, uh, we have to remember that the Chinese state doesn't bear sole responsibility for this. But the people in the West who propagated the myth of overpopulation, people like the authors of Limits to Growth, people like Paul Ehrlich, about whom we were talking over dinner, uh, they bear a terrible responsibility for the decisions that were made by the People's Republic of China. They may have just been exercising uh, what they considered to be a necessary deception on the West in order to deal with a problem they thought was important and critical. But women and children in China, especially girl children in China, have been dying in earnest uh, because of that hoax uh, for the last 20 years. I had an organization called the Population Research Institute. And we are kind of a one-of-a-kind organization. There are literally dozens of organizations, mostly funded by your tax dollars and mine, uh, and by the major foundations, on the other side of this question who are busily propagating uh, the myth of overpopulation. Uh, there's only one organization that seeks to, to puncture that myth, to expose human rights abuses in population control programs and show the other uh, deleterious effects of those, pro those programs, and that's us. Let's talk about human rights abuses for a minute. Everybody knows that China has been running roughshod over the rights of its citizens. But it's not just China. The myth of overpopulation propagated by the United States government and other dying Western countries, funded by our government and other dying Western countries, including Japan, uh, has been foisted on literally dozens of countries around the world. You know, it's not surprising that when you go to a country like Kenya, which has a very limited budget for health care, and you say to the Kenyan government, we will give you a generous grant of, say, $10 million this year, but you must use it only for family planning programs 
that the Kenyan government is likely to say yes to that offer. But of course it begins before that because the first thing that happens is our aid agency or the British aid agency or the Swedes will go into a country and say to the leadership, you have a population problem. And when the leadership of that country says, no, we don't think we have a population problem, uh, we will say, oh, yes, you do. And just to underline the point, you won't get any aid from the World Bank, uh, any soft loans from the World Bank, any short-term loans uh, from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, you won't get any assistance from any other UN agencies. And by the way, you won't get any aid from us or the other major Western donors until you admit you have a population problem. Uh, that concentrates their minds wonderfully because a lot of these countries are dependent on foreign aid. And so, reluctantly in many cases, uh, these countries in the 70s and 80s said, yes, well, if you think we have a population problem, uh, then yes, we do have a population problem. Now, can we please have foreign aid? And we say, yes, you can, but, but you have to, to pass through another wicket first. And the second wicket is, now that you've admitted you have a population problem, uh, you have to set targets and goals for reducing uh, the fertility of your women. You have to have a plan of action. And the country might respond, well, we don't have a plan of action. We don't have that kind of demographic expertise here in Uganda or Kenya or Mali. And we say, don't worry, we do. We have the plan already drawn up. Here it is. And it calls for fertility rates, for example. The plan for Kenya calls for the, uh, the uh, total fertility rate to be lowered to 2.5 children uh, by the year 2005, which is not very long away now. Uh, and we impose that on the Kenyan government. And then we say, now that you've admitted you have a population problem and you have a population plan, uh, here's some funding to carry it out. Now, many of these governments in the third world that were urging in the direction of population control do not have sterling human rights records. They have very bad human rights records. And what are we encouraging them to do in population control programs? We're encouraging them to intervene in the most private, decisions of husbands and wives about the number and spacing of their children. We're encouraging them to violate the human rights of their citizens. In fact, we're not just encouraging it, we're funding it, we're promoting it, uh, we gave, give them plans uh, to do it with. So it's not surprising that human rights abuses abound in these programs. Let me give you an example. In 1995, uh, President Alberto Fujimori at Peru was elected to a second term. His first foreign visitor was Assistant Secretary of State for Population and the Environment, Timothy Wirth. Timothy Wirth came down, former Senator Wirth from Colorado, came down uh, to tell Fujimori that, that Peru had a population problem. Now, Fujimori was an engineer by training. and. Uh, he had been uh, the recipient, his government had been the recipient of much family planning, foreign aid uh, for the previous 15 years. But he decided with U.S. encouragement, from the encourage, with the encouragement of USAID, with the encouragement of the United Nations Population Fund, to get very serious about population control. And he set in place a sterilization quota of 100,000 sterilizations a year to be done in his country. And he organized mobile sterilization teams, brought in experts from China and India in organizing sterilization campaigns, and then unleashed these teams on the countryside. And they would go from village to village, uh, putting up banners which said uh, Festivalle de Ligaduras, uh, ligation festival. And government officials would go house to house and tell women, Senora, it's time for you to come in and have your tubal ligation. And if they didn't want to come in, they would be visited again and again and again and again until they came in. After all, the, not only was there a national target of 100,000 sterilizations, there were individual quotas given to doctors and nurses. If you wanted to remain a doctor or nurse in good standing in Peru, where many of the doctors and nurses are government employees, you had to do two or three sterilizations a month. You had to, the Spanish word for it is captar. You had to capture, captar. You had to get two or three women, depending on your precise uh, status in the medical profession, uh, to come in for sterilization each month. If you made your quota, 
Then you were patted on the back and given little bonuses and, and, and gifts of various kinds. If you failed to meet your quota, you were criticized. You could be demoted. You could even be fired. So targets and quotas were a big part of the project. Meanwhile, our aid agency is standing by quietly applauding the fact that, that Peru has now finally gotten serious about population control. The United Nations Population Fund is not merely applauding and funding the program, it is serving as the technical secretary for the program, helping to draw up the details of it. So they're all in, uh, in, in uh, involved in this uh, sterilization campaign. Some of the other tactics they used are also interesting. They would go to women, poor women, who were receiving uh, nutritional subsidies for their children. And they would say, Senora, you have to come in for a sterilization in order to continue on in this food supplement program. In other words, they were using food as a weapon against the hungry women and children uh, to get the women to come in for sterilization. They would go to other women and they would say, uh, Senora, if you would like to get government benefits, uh, you must agree to be sterilized. Now there's an interesting thing about all of these population control campaigns, and that is they always target the other. The people who are carrying out the campaign, the people in charge, the people who are running it and setting the targets and quotas, don't target people like themselves to be sterilized and aborted and contracepted. Heaven forbid. In their view, you can never have too many people <laughs> that look like them and talk like them. It's always the other who is targeted. And in the Peruvian case, it wasn't the high status uh, descendants of Francisco Pizarro living in the capital city of Lima who were being sterilized against their will. It was the Quechua speaking Indians of the high Andes, the descendants of the Incas who of course were defeated by Francisco Pizarro and other groups in Peru. And you see this again and again. India had a very famous sterilization campaign in the 1970s. Some of you may recall it because it was the only major population control campaign that focused on men and not women. See, these campaigns invariably focus on women because women, for the most part, don't fight back. Men can and do. Well, this campaign focused on men. And as soon as it was announced, uh, the head of the World Bank, who was then Robert McNamara, flew to New Delhi to congratulate the Minister of Family Planning on finally getting serious about population control. And this law passed by India called for compulsory sterilization. Clearly compulsory, clearly coercive. And so they began sterilizing. Over the first six months of the campaign, they sterilized in excess of six million men. But then riots began. In, China, in India's major cities, men began taking to the streets by the hundreds of thousands, protesting these actions of the government. But not just uh, every man participated in the riots. There were two kinds of rioters. There were Muslims and there were untouchables. You see, because these two groups had figured out that they were the targets of the campaign. The campaign was being run by high caste Brahmins and the like. And of course, they naturally weren't sterilizing Brahmins. You can never have too many Brahmins. But you can have too many untouchables and too many Muslims. And so the campaign focused on the Muslims and the untouchables. When these two groups realized who was being targeted, uh, they took to the streets. There were demonstrations. Uh, it got very nasty. Uh, it ultimately led to Indira Gandhi being defeated in the next elections in India. Uh, as Fujimori was defeated, in, uh, as Fujimori uh, left office in 2000, he wasn't defeated. He could not serve a third term, but he was foiled in his effort to change the Constitution to allow him to run again in 2000. So he was forced out of office as well. In Sri Lanka, you have the majority Silanese targeting the minority Sri Lankans. Uh, in Indonesia, you have the Javanese targeting the people who live in Sumatra and the other islands. Uh, I could go on and on. It's always the majority targeting the minority, uh, one ethnic group targeting another, one religious group targeting another. In fact, if you look at population control in a global sense, that still holds true. Because isn't population control nothing more than the haves of the world targeting the have-nots? 
So human rights abuses abound in these programs, but they also, they also undermine primary health care. And it's easy to see why that would happen. That grant of $10 million that goes to the Ministry of Health in Kenya and is designated for use in population control programs is a magnet. It sucks in many doctors and nurses into these programs. And once they're in these programs, they only do what? They only do population control procedures. And they're taken out of the business of treating people who get malaria or dysentery or pneumonia. They're taken out of the business of primary health care. Now, I wanted to mention in passing uh, AIDS in Africa very briefly. I don't know if any of you have been, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been following the fact that we now have a huge uh, new government program uh, which was announced by President Bush in January in the State of the Union Address and which has now been approved by the House and Senate to set up a, to spend 15 billion dollars over the next five years on AIDS. And the principal um, uh, funding will go, I think, to Africa. Africa, of course, is in the grip of the worst uh, AIDS epidemic in the planet. But some recent evidence out of Africa suggests that we have not been told the truth about the AIDS epidemic in that part of the world. We have been told from the beginning of the AIDS epidemic in Africa that AIDS in Africa was a heterosexual phenomenon. Homosexuality is virtually non-existent in Africa. And the only reason we were told that Africa could have epidemic levels of AIDS is because of, of uh, of uh, heterosexual activity of all kinds. Well, that argument is now being questioned. It's being questioned because, first of all, surveys of sexual activity in Africa show that, that Africans are just about as monogamous, or if you want to look at it the other way, just about as, as, as polygamous as Americans. They have about the same rates of sexual activity. And we don't have a heterosexual epidemic here. The second thing that's become very clear is this, that there is a serious problem with medical transmission of AIDS in Africa. That in a poor country like Mali or Somalia or Kenya, that syringes and needles aren't just used once and thrown away. They're used again and again and again until the needle breaks or the syringe uh, wears out. Now, from the beginning of the AIDS epidemic in Africa, we have brought AIDS positive people together with AIDS negative people. Why? Because the population controllers in Africa, when AIDS began to be a problem, said to USAID, we're already dealing with sexually transmitted diseases. This is a sexually transmitted disease. It's caused by heterosexual, it's transmitted by heterosexual sex. So let us deal with it. We will simply integrate the clinics. And so what you have in Africa now are population control organizations that are running integrated clinics where they do in the same room and with the same equipment do AIDS treatment programs along with STD programs and family planning programs. Now what do you think that does? Well that brings HIV positive people together with HIV negative people and it subjects them to the same kinds of invasive medical procedures. We have sent about 100 million needles and syringes to Africa over the last 10 years to give injections of Depo-Provera, which is a contraceptive that uh, chemically sterilizes a woman for three months. Those syringes and needles can be used again and again, and they are used again and again. A couple of recent studies estimate that 70 to 80 percent of the AIDS cases in Africa were not transmitted by heterosexual sex, but were transmitted by bad medical practice. And so we have been arguing in Washington uh, for the last couple of months that family planning programs and invasive medical procedures and family planning programs, including Depo-Provera injections and other procedures, have been an important cause of the spread of AIDS in Africa. So population control programs have a lot to answer for. And of course, in a world of falling fertility, population control programs make no sense at all. 
I mean, we have seen dramatic reductions over the last 40 years in birth rates everywhere. We have seen in Mexico the total fertility rate go from six children in 1960 down to a little over two children today, about 2.4. That's only slightly above replacement rate fertility given Mexico's uh, rather poor primary health care system uh, that may be replacement rate for fertility. Uh, we have seen birth rates drop not just in China because of coercion but in other Asian countries down to uh, replacement rate levels in Sri Lanka. India is only slightly above replacement rate fertility now. Thailand is at or below replacement rate fertility. So what sense does it make to continue pouring literally hundreds of millions of dollars each year into population control programs, especially in countries which are not replacing themselves? We have about half the countries of the world now with below replacement, at or below replacement fertility, and the rest of the world seems to be following quickly. Our long-term problem is not going to be, I think, too many children, uh, but too few children. And you can see that future uh, in today's present in Japan, for example. Uh, Japan has been in the economic doldrums, as you know, for the last 12, 13 years. The stock market collapsed. It hasn't recovered. The real estate market collapsed. It hasn't recovered. I think a large part of that has to do with the fact that the Japanese birth rate fell below replacement in 1964, and it is now at the historically unprecedented level of about 1.3 children per couple. At that rate, the Japanese Ministry of Health estimates that in the year 3000, there will be 500 Japanese left. <laughs> now, why they projected out that far, I don't know. But, you know, that's not just a wild guesstimate. That is, given current birth rates, that is a statistical certainty that the Japanese uh, are committing a kind of collective suicide by not having enough children to replace themselves. Europe is also not providing for itself in the most fundamental way by providing uh, the next generation of people uh, to inhabit the continent. As the Europeans disappear, other peoples will move in. That's been the case throughout history, of course, but uh, it, does, it does give me a little pang to think that uh, the lands of, of some of my ancestors are, are, going to be, uh, are going to be in different hands in a couple centuries. I like the Italians, for example, but the Italians are now averaging what is probably the lowest uh, birth rate in recorded history. They're averaging about 1.1 children per couple. So these are total fertility rates uh, over a woman's uh, reproductive lifetime. Uh, that means that couples are averaging one child voluntarily averaging one child, not because of coercion from the state. Italy's population, 66, 67 million, is going to be cut in half in a couple of generations and is going to be decimated by the end of this century. Now, I like the Italians. I'm going to miss them. But if they don't start having children, they're gone. Uh, Antonio Golini, a professor of demography at the University of Milan, said recently, he said, you know, in 50 years, Italy is going to be a Catholic theme park. <laughs> he said the, the great cathedrals will still be there. The Italians will be gone and the ticket takers will be Turks and Albanians. <laughs> so it's a strange thing, isn't it, that, that so many people should have chosen uh, not, not to replace themselves, that whole peoples are dying. It's not the first time in history this has happened, of course. The reason for the decline of ancient Greece and the rise of Rome in part was not simply because of the military valor and virtue of the Romans, but because the Greeks stopped having children. They got comfortable, uh, they had a massive slave population, and Plutarch criticized them a few hundred years before the birth of Christ, saying that, that young Greeks are not, having, not getting married as they should, and not when they get married, they're not having the children that they should. He said the countryside is being depopulated. And if you look at some of the, the, the battles that were fought in, in those latter days, it was uh, very clear that the Greeks were no longer able to assemble an army because they had few, few, few too young men to serve and fell under the sway of the Romans. Several hundred years later, of course, the same thing happened to the Romans. Uh, the Roman Empire depopulated. It wasn't so much the barbarians crashed through the gates as that they were invited in because 
the fields were lying fallow and the roads couldn't be kept cleared and the irrigation networks were, were falling apart and Rome needed people. Once they were inside the gates, of course, they, they took over. So it won't be the first time in human history that a people has so uh, gotten so caught up in the world or so lost faith in itself, I think there are different reasons for different times and different peoples, that they, that they stop reproducing themselves. Uh, it may be that the modern welfare state uh, is a form of collective suicide. I mean, by cutting the links between the generations, by, by making the elderly no longer dependent upon their children for support in old age, by turning the young through lengthy public schooling and economic burdens instead of economic blessings, you've severed the links between the generations and man being an economic animal in the absence of other motivations will, will not have more than the number of children they want just to amuse themselves. They do not have to provide for themselves in old age by having children anymore. So it may be the modern welfare state is a form of, uh, is a form of collective suicide. But what are we to do about these, these programs, these programs that got underway in the late 1960s and early 1970s in our country under false pretenses on the basis of false science. I mean, it really wasn't science at all. I mean, that Paul Ehrlich was doing over the years. Paul Ehrlich had just find a very good way, he'd found a very good way to make a living. He found that scary stories tell, uh, scary, scary stories sell. And uh, look at all the books he sold. Uh, look at the lecture fees that he's, he's drawn over the years, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Look at all the failed predictions he's made. You know, you think that, uh, you'd think that the fact that he estimated uh, in the population bomb that 200 million people would starve to death by the late 1970s, you'd think that when it didn't happen, he would have issued a, an apology. He didn't. He simply went on to write another book saying that 200 million people are going to die in the 80s. The books were selling. You wonder, you know, if he doesn't learn from his mistakes. Well, I think he did learn from his mistakes. He learned from his mistakes that his mistakes paid, and they paid very well in terms of book royalties and lecture fees and invitations to be on Johnny Carson. So we began these programs in a crisis mode, an artificially induced crisis. But these programs have taken upon themselves a, a, a life of their own. They get, almost as a matter of right, their annual appropriation of 400 and something million dollars uh, from the U.S. Treasury and many hundreds of millions of dollars from the treasuries of other industrialized countries. And it seems difficult to stop them. I mean, movements with billions of dollars at their disposal don't go quietly to their graves, do they? They have to be buried. So how do we bury them? Well, the first thing that we did in the 90s was we tried to stop increases in population control spending. We talked about the falling numbers, the falling birth rate everywhere. We talked about human rights abuses. We talked a lot about China. And we were able to get some of the funding cut off. You know, we, we, we are now no longer funding, you and I, the United Nations Population Fund. President Bush decided last July that that, that $34 million could be better used on primary health care in Afghanistan and Pakistan than on population control programs funded by the United Nations Population Fund in places like China. Now why did he decide that? Well he decided that because an organization called Population Research Institute sent investigators into China. I couldn't go. <laughs> My wife won't let me go to China. But um, I sent, we sent investigators into China and we sent investigators to a model county program run by the United Nations Population Fund. And the United Nations Population Fund had been telling us wonderful things about its model county programs in China. It said we have 32 counties in China out of China's uh, 3,000 counties, 32 that the Chinese government has given us to run family planning programs in. And in our counties, our model counties, there is no coercion. Women are free to choose the timing and spacing of their pregnancies. Uh, there's no uh, forced abortion, no forced sterilization. There are no targets, no quotas for sterilizations uh, or anything else. Everything is wonderful here. It's a client-centered program. 
Well, we decided to test that claim. I mean, that, that was an eminently testable claim, and we decided to test it. And so we went to a county in southern China, in Guangdong province, Suhui County, and looked into the UNFPA's model county program there. What do you think we found? We found forced abortion, forced sterilization, targets, quotas. Women laughed. They laughed when we said, are you free to choose the timing and spacing of your child, ch you know, your child birthing? They said, no. So we proved that, uh, that the United Nations Population Fund had simply lied about what it was doing in China. And the Congress proved interested in that. We testified before the House International Relations Committee in a very friendly hearing chaired by Henry Hyde and Chris Smith and boycotted by all the Democrats. Um, and then we testified in a very hostile hearing on the Senate side before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee Subcommittee on Asia headed by Barbara Boxer, <laughs> by Senator Boxer, whose first question to our investigator was, did Population Research Institute pay you to go to China? <laughs> Anything to discredit the witness. And of course, she hadn't been paid. She'd been a volunteer. So, uh, but the end result of that was we did get the funds cut off to the United Nations Population Fund, and it seems unlikely that they will see any funds as long as the current administration is in Washington. And we've investigated other programs. We investigated, of course, the program in Peru, called it to the attention of... Uh, of Washington in the late 1990s and then went back a year later to look at it again. And the latest in that is, um, in, in Peru, is that the Peruvian Congress has published a report on the Peru sterilization campaign, uh, which implicates USAID and UNFPA as being involved in that campaign. So now we have the democratically elected Congress of Peru complaining about the fact that we helped to impose targets and quotas on that country which led to significant human rights abuses. And uh, I got a letter from uh, the woman who directs the global health programs at USAID. Uh, global health includes family, the biggest component of global health is family planning, unfortunately. Um, and, and she said that report has been completely discredited. And a few weeks after receiving the letter, the, the Peruvian Congress Human Rights Commission approved the report, so I was able to write back to her and say, I don't think so. But they've been pulling out all the stops down there. Our bureaucrats, of course, the permanent government in Washington, the one that is there regardless of which administration is in power, which party is occupying the White House, the bureau bureaucracy there uh, is very committed to the notion of population control. And our permanent government has been busily trying to cover up its tracks in Peru and, and, uh, and, uh, and lobby uh, the Peruvian Congress down there not to, to uh, make accusations like that. Fortunately, they haven't been successful. Um, we've also gotten legislation passed uh, defining what uh, voluntary means uh, when we're talking about family planning. You see, the programs from the beginning have been called voluntary family planning, but voluntary has never been defined. Why? Because it was convenient to leave it undefined. But we've now defined it in law, uh, in something called the TIART law, after Todd TIART of Kansas. And the TIART law says that you cannot have targets and quotas in population control programs. You cannot use experimental methods on women in population control programs, you know, because women in the developing world have often been used as guinea pigs in developing new sterilization procedures or new uh, kinds of contraceptives. And they've suffered terribly as a result. I mean, women in Pakistan, for example, uh, had Norplant implanted in their arm when Norplant was new on the market. And when they began suffering serious side effects and went back to have it removed, they were told, well, we were just paid to put it in as part of the experiment, but we weren't, uh, we're not, you have to pay us if you want to have it removed. Uh, Norplan has now been, of course, uh, withdrawn from the American market by its manufacturer because so many uh, women suffered serious medical consequences as a result. Um, so we've used developing world women as guinea pigs uh, often in the past. Uh, as to develop new weapons in the war on people. And uh, we're no longer, the law says, we won't be able to do that any longer. Uh, the other thing the law says is that it mandates informed consent. 
you can't just go to a woman in, in Bangladesh and say, I've got a magic pill uh, that will make you and your children healthier and then implant Norplant or, or give her a Depo-Provera injection. You have to tell her what you're doing and you have to get her informed consent to the procedure. And of course, it outlaws coercion in program. Now the problem is to enforce this because these programs, these targets, these quotas, the coercive elements are deeply embedded into these programs. And ultimately the solution is this, I think. The solution has to be simply to end these programs, take the money away from population control programs altogether, and either simply zero out the funding or take the money and put them into child survival programs and primary health care programs. So that's what uh, we're working on these days. We came a couple of years ago within about six votes in the House of taking a hundred million dollars away from the population controllers and putting it into primary health care, uh, which would have meant things like vitamins and, and uh, nutritional supplements and oral rehydration therapy for children in the, th in the developing world. So um, the fight goes on. Let me um, tell you that I do think this is a part of the, the larger battle against the left. Uh, one of the, the great uh, commonalities of all of the interest groups on, on the left side of the political spectrum is that they think there are too many people in the world. This is a, a reflection of their, 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 their basic elitism in part. Uh, different groups have different motivations. There's kind of an unholy trinity, though, of groups that are the primary, primary supporters of population control programs. And these are the groups that we fight every day in Washington. Of course, the first group is the population controllers themselves, uh, who believe the population of the world should be drastically reduced. Uh, one of their number, Garrett Hardin, who wrote uh, The Tragedy of the Commons, one of the leaders of the uh, environmental movement in the United States, now retired professor emeritus of biology at the University of California at Santa Barbara, uh, said recently that he thought the optimum carrying capacity of the world was 100 million people. He didn't tell us what he was going to do with the other 6 billion of us, but I'm sure he has his plans. Uh, some sort of humane reduction is in store for us. Uh, but the other side is still spouting nonsense like this. The, 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 the whole notion that you can apply uh, the, the, uh, the, the idea of carrying capacity to human beings, of course, is, is nonsense. Um, the second group that supports population control in a big way, of course, are the radical environmentalists, uh, whose idea of paradise is the Garden of Eden before the creation of Adam and Eve. Uh, they want the garden but they don't want humanity. And they would also like to see our numbers uh, radically reduced. I, um, when I was a boy, I was a member of the Audubon Society, but I, I uh, am sad to say that the Audubon Society with all the other major environmental groups has gone uh, way, uh, 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 way away from its founder, founder's vision. Uh, they not only try to preserve populations of birds, they now try to reduce the population of humans. And I was in the halls of Congress a couple of years ago when I ran into an Audubon Society activist down from New York City uh, who um, became very angry when he learned that my wife and I had eight children. And he looked at me and he said, you people have all these children just so you can dominate the political process. And I had to laugh, you know, because when I talk to my wife about whether or not we should have another child, the last thing I mention is dominating the political process. I mean, she would, she would, that wouldn't get me anywhere at all. Um, so, and I said, well, you know, um, how many children do you have? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm unmarried. I have no children. And he was about my age. He was in his mid-50s. And I said, well, you realize, of course, that, that it's going to be my children who are paying your social security payments when you retire in a few years. And I said, and furthermore, uh, it's going to be one of my children who answers the phone when you call 911 and have your first uh, heart attack or stroke. It's going to be one of my children or the child of someone who chose to have children who drives the ambulance, brings you to the hospital, who does the open heart surgery, who takes care of you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be one of my children in the hospice in the final days of your life. 
it won't be one of your children because you didn't have any. So, so um, people are the ultimate resource. I think that's something that, uh, that Dr. Peter Beckman understood very well. Uh, they're the one resource that you cannot do without. And countries like China and, and other countries which undertake a radical a reduction of population growth and even ultimately a radical reduction of their population because China has right now, as part of its long-term population plan, the idea of continuing the one-child policy until the year 2050 first and of reducing China's population down to its carrying capacity, carrying capacity of uh, 700 million or so by the end of the century. And if they do so, they will only succeed in making the government stronger, less humane, less democratic if that's possible, uh, the economy weaker, and, uh, and the subject people of China uh, even, even, uh, even more, in, impose on them even more suffering. Because ultimately what population control is, is a power grab on the part of governments and organizations. You see, because isn't it convenient isn't it so very convenient that the Chinese Communist Party has a scapegoat for all of its problems? When the Chinese people say, we're so far behind in science and technology, we're so far behind economically, our per capita income is so low, our lifespan is so much shorter than the lifespan of people in Western countries. Our healthcare system is so inadequate compared to the healthcare system in North America. The Chinese Communist Party can completely disclaim responsibility for that state of affairs and say, well, if only you would stop having children, we would have solved these problems long, long ago. And of course, that's the exact opposite of the truth, isn't it? Because the truth is, that if only the Chinese Communist Party had ceased to exist long, long ago, the people of China, like the people of Taiwan, like the people of Hong Kong, like the Chinese and Malaysia and Singapore and Southeast Asia, like the Chinese in this country, Chinese Americans, would have long since raised China to the ranks of the developed nations. Well, let me stop here and ask if there are any questions. It's about midnight my time, but I'm happy to... <laughs> What's McNamara up to at present? Robert McNamara has left us. Uh, he's, he's no longer with us. But, uh, but he was one of, he, uh, he was one of the... Uh, uh, the ones who imposed population control on the world when he was first nominated by, by uh, it must have been um, Lyndon Johnson uh, to be the president of the World Bank. He had the president, uh, Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson make a surprise appearance in 1968 at uh, the meeting of the World Bank trustees. And reading a prepared script, President Johnson said that uh, that uh, there's no point in giving foreign aid to countries unless, uh, unless they control their population. And McNamara then made as a condition of World Bank loans that countries have population control programs in, in place. So uh, he was one of the founders of this and one of the big promoters of this. And the World Bank's uh, operations are very secretive. As you probably know, they have 10,000 employees uh, in Washington scattered about in about 17 massive buildings in, in downtown DC. They have a population section of about 600 people that is completely isolated from the rest of the World Bank. I mean, you know, I have some friends, not to say informants at the World Bank, but uh, unless you're in the population section, you cannot get access to the programs that they're funding. Now, why would they be? They're perfectly happy to announce uh, the building of a dam somewhere, if they build any dams anymore. I don't know. Maybe they don't. Uh, or road construction, but they keep their population control programs very secretive. And uh, there's a reason for that. And, and the reason is these programs are not very popular in uh, other parts of the world. Imagine if the, the Chinese government, or the Peruvian government, or the Mexican government, or any government of the world, 
funded population controlled programs in the United States and paid workers to go door to door to homes and offices in the United States telling women that it was time for them to come in for sterilization. And you'll get a sense, and you'll get from that a sense of how people overseas react to these programs. Yes? Welfare reform and population control in the United States. Um, I think that the welfare program, as we all know and I think agree on, has created a, a, a tremendous level of dependency uh, among the underclass in this country. It has created intergenerational uh, welfare dependency which is inherited uh, from one generation to the next. And we need to end welfare as we know it. There are some who argue that uh, women on welfare should be sterilized, chemically or surgically. Well, they shouldn't be allowed to have children because after all, they're dependent on the rest of us. I don't think that gets to the root of the problem. In fact, I think that, in a sense, exacerbates the problem. Because one of the things that, that, that promotes maturity and responsibility and self-control is having the responsibility of caring for someone else, caring for a child. So for some women, at least, that is the, a, a road out of welfare, the notion that their children need to be cared for, they need to become responsible. But for the most part, we simply need to end, uh, end welfare and, uh, and uh, put women temporarily uh, who need help in group home situations where you have responsible adults in charge. Uh, there is no worse prescription, I think, for a young girl uh, who's gotten pregnant uh, by someone who is no longer in the picture than to say, well, now that you've gotten pregnant, you win the lottery. We're going to give you an apartment of your own and a check every month uh, for the next 18 years because that simply creates a situation where other uh, young men will come and take advantage of her. Uh, they need to be in group situations. They need to be, uh, have in a group living situation certain responsibilities, chores within the the, the group home, they need to get up at a certain time, they need to have a, uh, they need to learn the same kind of skills that they will need one day when they get a job. They need to learn to get dressed in the morning, to take care of themselves, to report to work, and to work diligently. And that has to be taught them because a lot of these children don't know that. They've never had anyone to be responsible to. And by giving them money, you simply make them more irresponsible and their children after them. Yes?
So that's the other thing. Well, they had all been involved, if they were in the medical profession, they had all been involved in the population control program for many years. In China. But China. not, yes, but not, they weren't in the business of trying to save the lives of yeah. premature they infants. Let me, uh, let me tell you a story. I wrote, it was a good story. I wrote it for the Reader's Digest. In fact, it was so good. Um, there was a young doctor, a uh, young woman doctor on duty in China. Uh, the date was December 24th. Uh, this was a few years ago. And she had the night shift. She was an OBGYN. She had been uh, uh, a doctor for just about nine months and was working in a large hospital in southern China, not far from Shenzhen, not far from Hong Kong, inside of Guangdong province. And um, she had had a busy night. I think she delivered a couple of babies already and had gone uh, to rest uh, for a minute in the cot set aside for that purpose when the nurse came pounding on the door saying, uh, we have a problem, come quick. Well, the problem was that a, uh, a, a, a baby, about 33 weeks gestation, seven months along, baby boy had been born after a failed abortion. And the nurses had the baby on the cold stone floor uh, and, uh, and had a hypodermic and a syringe ready for the doctor when she came in. The syringe was filled with formaldehyde and she was expected to take the syringe, which was fitted with a hypodermic needle, and inject it through the fontanelle, through the soft spot in the child's skull to kill the baby. She was expected to, to uh, administer the coup de grace, infanticide. And she refused to do it. Uh, she picked the baby up, wrapped the baby up, put the baby on a warming table, because these things are done in the same maternity ward, that the killings are done in the same maternity ward where the babies are, are cared for sometimes. And, uh, and attempted to, to, the baby was breathing just fine, and what you, you know, if, if, if the main problem you expect at that, at that gestational age is, is are, are respiratory. So the baby was doing fine, but the, supervisor, the hospital supervisor was called in. And the hospital supervisor yelled at Dr. Yang and said, you're violating government policy, and picked up the hypodermic syringe and went to give the injection. And Dr. Yang, our young Chinese doctor, knocked the syringe out of her hand. Now, now she was really in trouble. She was really in trouble because the China, China's birth control regulations say that anyone who interferes with the population control program will be punished, and anyone who interferes with the population control program seriously will be punished seriously. You don't want to be punished seriously in China. That means that's bad news. She was sent into internal exile uh, rather than to the Chinese gulag because she was a doctor and I think the state didn't want to waste her talents completely by sending her to a labor camp. So they sent her to a re remote mountain village in northern Guangdong province and she was placed under the uh, it, it, it's called the, the guidance and surveillance of the local Communist Party branch. So she was, the, she was in charge of the village medical clinic during the day, and, but she couldn't leave. She wasn't allowed to travel. She was basically under house arrest. And being a woman alone in a strange village with no male relatives around, she was, she was repeatedly violated. She finally managed to escape from there and make her way to Hong Kong and to the United States where she applied to political for political asylum. The asylum judge uh, was on the verge of denying her claim because he didn't believe it. He found it incredible. He denied that these things could be happening anywhere in the world, in China or anywhere else. That was when I got involved. <laughs> I went up to San Francisco uh, to the, you know, the, 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 the asylum adjudication process takes place in a courtroom because they have their own um, uh, courtrooms in the... Um, in the uh, Immigration Naturalization Service. Now it's been divided again. but uh, And it's like a regular court procedure. So I was sworn in and from the witness stand spent the next two hours explaining to this, uh, this judge, this administrative judge who worked for the INS, uh, that these things in fact not only do happen in China, but they happen in China on a daily basis. And here's the evidence. And so reluctantly, uh, he finally granted her claim. Um, because she had been expected to kill a human being and had interfered with someone else when they attempted uh, that same murder. The baby, after she was arrested, of course, the baby was killed anyway, so all of her efforts went for naught. But those sorts of things happen all the time in China. I once 
interviewed the head of a large military hospital in South China. And uh, I forget what his name was, but uh, he was a very congenial sort, very forthcoming. I asked him about the birth control program. And I said, is it ever the case that women come into your hospital, you know, in labor about to give birth to illegal children? And uh, he said, yes, it happens all the time. They're brought in. If, they're, if a woman is found uh, hiding in an alleyway or hiding out in a village and, and, and uh, she's very close to term or in labor, she's immediately brought into the hospital so we can deal with it. Well, how do you deal with it? He said, well, we wait until the, the cervix is fully dilated and the baby's head is crowning the normal presentation. And then we take a hypodermic syringe and you know he went through the whole procedure. We fill it with formaldehyde or alcohol uh, and then we give a lethal injection. And I said, isn't that considered infanticide? And he said, oh no, oh no, he said, not in China. He said, in China, abortion is legal up to the point of partuition. So that as long as the baby had one foot in the womb, as it were, this was a, a legal procedure. Well, in fact, babies are killed after birth as well because doctors and nurses are under such pressure not to allow illegal children to see the light of day and they don't get, want to get in trouble that they will that they will give lethal injections after birth as Dr. Yang's supervisor. Oh, defective babies are m more often killed than not. Uh, you see because one of the aspects of China's population control program uh, the governing slogan for the program goes uh, like, uh, like that. We have any Chinese speakers in the room? Wan Huan, Wan Sheng, Xiao Sheng, Yo Sheng, which means late, late marriage, late birth. You get married late in life. Late birth, you don't have a baby right away. You have to wait a few years. A few births, which means one in the countryside, sometimes two now, and then quality births. There is a eugenics component to China's one child policy. And it's something that, you know, the Chinese people now take very seriously. They know they're only allowed one child. They want their only child to be male, for the most part, and they want the little boy to be perfect. And if there are any obvious deformities, cleft palate or club foot, even those that are easily surgically correctable, even I have heard of babies being killed because they had birthmarks on their face. Uh, these babies are, are simply executed and the parents go back and try again because the government tells them relentlessly and ceaselessly, we want to improve the quality of the Chinese people. The orphanages are filled with little girls and handicapped children both of whom have been, both classes of, of little babies are abandoned, of course. So, um, yes, sir? The fate of twins. Uh, the fate of twins can be, uh, a sp uh, twins can suffer one of three fates. Uh, they can both be killed. Uh, when I was in the village in China in 1980, uh, there was a, a woman who was pregnant in a neighboring village. Um, they, they didn't have an ultrasound machine. They didn't know she was carrying twins. She had no prenatal care whatsoever. I mean, they were avoiding uh, the family planning authorities. Uh, but the local party official uh, arrested her, had her arrested, and took her in when she was seven and a half months pregnant. And the abortion was immediately done at the local hospital. They do these abortions by cesarean section, by the way. Um, they normally give a lethal injection into the, into the uterus, uh, which is supposed to cause the death of the unborn child and within 24 to 48 hours bring on uterine contractions and, and the now dead baby is then ejected from the womb. When this doesn't happen, when this doesn't happen, um, in, instead of going in vaginally and trying to take the baby out piecemeal, they, they do a cesarean section and remove the now dead baby. Uh, these, this woman was found to be carrying twins. Now, the family had a little girl already and they'd been hoping for a boy. And the fact that it was twin boys was just a double, tra a monstrous tragedy in the eyes of everyone in the village. The father of, of the woman who was aborted lost, her, lost his mind 
uh, and went over to the local uh, village head's house. The, the, went over to the house of the fellow who had his wife arrested and took the man's two sons, who I think were ten and eight, and threw them down a well and then jumped in himself. So it was a, a double murder and a suicide. And the wells in this part of China very, uh, are, are very narrow and, and deep. And, you know, once you're, there's no way to get back out. So, um, so uh, both of them are killed. One of them is, might be allowed to live. That's the second, the second alternative. There are cases where uh, a woman has been asked, which one do you want? Which is a choice that nobody should have to make where your children are concerned. And, and, and in some cases, you know, the twins have been allowed to, uh, to live. Uh, but there are punishments for having an illegal second child. And people who break the rules are fined heavily. Uh, and the second child, whether it be twins or a second child conceived and born several years later, uh, a second child, an illegal child, is always going to be an unregistered non-person in Chinese society. Uh, they're called um, hei, hei huko. Uh, hei means black, which has no reference to, to, to melanin, skin color. It, it's a reference to the fact that these people are, are, um, are not recognized by the law, cannot get any government benefits, cannot get a government job, cannot get access to any government services whatsoever. And uh, that's unjust, of course. I mean, why should the sins of the fathers be visited upon the children. The children have done nothing wrong, and yet they're stigmatized, and, and they're going to be uh, second-class citizens, actually no-class citizens, zero-class citizens, the rest of their lives. Yes, sir? Am I correct in understanding that you buy into the idea that HIV positive equals AIDS? <laughs> Well, I really, I really don't want to. I really don't want to go there um, because I, I know that this is a matter of uh, of debate uh, for us. Well, I lived in Africa from '66 to '69, and we had people dying of AIDS all around us without the benefit of HIV positive. Well, since since AIDS uh, has been defined in Africa symptomatically, uh, without any testing being done. Uh, I'm sure there are, there are many victims of tuberculosis and malaria and typhoid and typhus and everything else you can name, all the tropical diseases that are endemic in Africa, who are now being mistakenly classified as AIDS victims because there is a huge pot of money out there, and the worse the situation is made to seem, uh, the faster uh, the money will come and the more generously it will be distributed. So. Uh, would, I, would I prefer it if uh, President Bush had not proposed a $15 billion AIDS program? Probably so. Uh, we are trying to do what we can with the situation as we find it. Uh, we are trying to prevent a billion dollars from going to the Global AIDS Fund. What is the Global AIDS Fund? Well, it's another UN boondoggle. This is a, a united... Uh, Kofi Annan proposed the, the Global Fund for AIDS uh, back in 1999. And basically what it is, it's a bank account at the World Bank, staffed. The secretariat is uh, composed of people from the World Health Organization. And they want to give the money to International Planned Parenthood Federation, to uh, all of the major, the Marie Stopes people, all of the major population control players around the world. They want to give the money to their friends. Uh, we are trying to stop any money from going to the UN for this purpose. So, yes, way over in the left. Uh, the late Herman Kahn was interviewed on television some years ago about population growth, and he said, I don't think it's really a problem because uh, every time you raise the standard of living on the country, the population growth rate goes down. So if you just concentrate on raising the standard of living, the problem takes care of itself. Yeah, well, that that's certainly true. I mean, you can see you can see that from the last 200 years. Um, but the other thing that's true is that 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 population growth uh, stimulates economic development. That population growth creates temporary shortages in goods, and in a free market society, entrepreneurs come along and create different methods of producing the same goods more cheaply or substitutes and at the end of the day you have more abundant goods at a cheaper price and so uh, it, it 
it, uh, I think it's clear that Australia would be uh, a, a much wealthier place if it had 80 million people instead of 18 million people, for example. Um, so, I agree with uh, Dr. Khan.